you know, you guys were in this position where you were ahead um, and and setting the bar for others. And so so they were reactive, right, to, w- to what you had coming out. Mm-hmm. We happened to be doing this interview a few days after Gemini 3 came right, out. Right. And, you know, there is a degree to which your rivals mm-hmm. um, at times, like, yeah, I mean, there's this back and forth going on. And, and I know the benchmarks are sort of controversial how valuable they are. But, mm-hmm. you know, people go ahead on these things. So how do you also, um, as time has gone on, maintain that luxury or that intellectual position where you feel like we're just going to do what we're going to do. Yeah. I, I think AI research today, the landscape is just much more competitive than it's ever been. Um, and the important thing is to not get caught up in that competitive dynamic because you can always say, Hey, you know, I'm going to ship an incremental update that puts me in front of my competitor for, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And, I don't think that's the long-term sustainable way to do research because if you crack that next paradigm, that's just going to matter so much more, right? You're going to shape the evolution of it. You're going to understand kind of all the side research directions um, around that sphere of ideas. And so when you think about kind of um, our RO program as an example of this, right? We bet more than two years ago that we're really going to crack RO on language models. And this was a very unpopular bet at the time. Uh, you know, right now it seems obvious, but... Back then, the environment was, hey, you know, there's this pre-training machine that's working great. There's this post-training machine that's working great. Why invest in something else? And I think today, everyone would tell you, you know, thinking in language models, it's just a primitive you can't have, uh, can't live without. And um, so we're, we're really there to make these bold bets and to figure out how we can scale and build the algorithms to really scale to orders of magnitude more compute than we have today. It's just, it, you know, I mean, and I get that intellectually in my, you know, it gets harder as you guys started as a, like basically a pure research company. Mm-hmm. When you look at OpenAI today, I mean, you have product line, there's parts of OpenAI that look much mm-hmm. more familiar to a mature Microsoft or a mm-hmm. Google where you have product lines, you've got all these different things that you have to serve. Yeah. Typically, I feel like you guys are still young enough, so maybe you don't have these exact pressures yet. But, you know, as those companies go on, it always becomes, well, we're more focused on the things that are serving the bottom line than spending Mm -hmm. a ton of money on research always seems to get like dwindled down Mm. over time. Yeah. And I think that's really one of the most special things about OpenAI. At its core, we're a pure AI research company. And I don't think you can say that of many other companies out there. And you know, we were founded as a nonprofit and I joined during that era. And I think the spirit is, you know, build AGI, advance AGI research at, at all costs um, and do it in a safe way, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I actually do think that's the best head fake to really creating value, right? If you focus and you win at the research, the value is easy to create. So um, I think there's a trap of getting too lost into like, oh, you know, um, let's drive up the bottom line. Uh, when in reality, if you do the best research, that part of the picture is very easy. And you you started in 2018. In 2018, and, and yeah. so you feel like that soul, that 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 um, yeah, that core culture and that core nucleus, it's it's really persistent. It's still there. Yeah. What is it? Elon says? Uh, what does he say? He says we shouldn't call any of you guys researchers. It's just engineering. Right? Yeah. No, I think yeah. We <laughs> no, it's it's true because I feel like once you have this hierarchy. Um, and you elevate, let's say, research science um, as a thing beyond engineering, you've completely already lost the game. Because, you know, when you're building a big model, uh, so much is in the practice of optimizing all of those, you know, little percentages of, you know, how do you make your kernels that much faster? Um, How do you make sure the numerics all work? Um, and that's a deep engineering practice. And if you don't have that part of the picture, you can't scale to, to the number of GPUs we use today. So, because I think there, well, okay, mm-hmm. but there is like a mystique that surrounds a researcher mm-hmm. versus an engineer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So are you, were you do you feel like um, it is better to kind of stay level-headed on that? Is that, is that kind of what you're saying or... or? Um, well, I, I just feel like researchers, they come in so many different shapes. You know, uh, some of our best researchers, they're, uh, they're the type that, you know, they come up with a billion ideas, right? And 
Many of them are not good, but you know, <laughs> just when you're about to be like, ah, oh, is this person really worth yeah. it? They come up with some, you know, phenomenal idea. Um, some of them are just, you know, so good at kind of executing on on the clear path ahead. And so there's just so many different shapes of researchers. And I think it's hard to just lump it into one stereotypical type Locks. that works. That me. makes sense. Um, okay, I won't I won't belabor you with mm -hmm. too many competitive like rival questions it's just since gemini 3 did come out i did wonder yeah. what mm -hmm. happens with you personally or the team mm -hmm. when one of your rivals puts it like does everybody go and look and see what it can do and is there like a is there a prompt or a question that you throw you often throw at these new models to see what they can do yeah yeah so um to speak to gemini 3 specifically you know it's a pretty good model um and I think one thing we do is try to build consensus. You know, um, the benchmarks only tell you so much. Um, and just looking purely at the benchmarks, you know, we actually felt quite confident. Um, you know, we have models internally that uh, perform at the level of Gemini 3, and we're pretty confident that we will release them soon and we can release successor models that are even better. Um, but yeah, again, kind of the benchmarks only tell you so much. And I you know I I think everyone probes uh, the the models in their own way. There there is this math problem <laughs> I like to give the models. Uh, okay. I I think so far none of them has quite cracked it. You, you, even the thinking models. Um, so yeah, I'll wait for that. Is this is this like a secret math um, problem? Oh no no no. Um, well, if I announce it here, maybe it gets trained on. But um, <laughs> yeah, I I do think uh, it, it's one of the nice puzzles of last year. It's this. Um, the 42 problem. So you, you want to create this random number generator mod 42, and you have access to a bunch of primitives, which are random number generators modulo times less than 42. And you want to make as few calls on expectation to these sub generators as possible. Um, so it, it's a very cute puzzle, but um, the language models, they get pretty close to the optimal solution, but I haven't seen one quite cracked.